Welcome to today's Energy Central webcast entitled, The State of the Energy Industry, presented by Scott Madden. A few housekeeping notes we would like to mention. As many of you are aware, today's event was originally scheduled to take place on March 8th. However, due to a nationwide service disruption within the GoToWebinar platform, the webcast did not take place as scheduled. Both Energy Central and Scott Madden are sorry for your inconvenience, and we want to extend a warm welcome back to those of you connecting again with us today. Following the presentation, we will have a brief question and answer period. You may submit your questions at any time using the interface on your screen. Now I'd like to turn the floor over to Stu Pearman, partner and energy practice leader, to kick off our event. Stu, welcome to the event. You have the floor. Thank you, PJ. And welcome to our spring webcast of the Scott Madden Energy Industry Update. And yes, I'm happy to report it really is spring now. It's 66 degrees where I am. The Scott Madden Energy Industry Update is issued twice a year. It goes out to about 8,000 energy industry leaders just like you. This webcast is based on a special edition of the issue we just released and is entitled The State of the Energy Industry. I'd like to thank Energy Central for making this webcast possible, and we especially want to thank you for joining us today. Our theme is decision time. As an industry, we face elections that didn't have extensive energy policy discussion or certainly resolution, renewed interest in renewable support, climate change, coupled with vague talk of an energy grand bargain, maybe Keystone XL in exchange for greenhouse gases with the carrot that the greenhouse gas law would be a better deal than what's going to happen uh, with EPA regulation under the Clean Air Act. So against this backdrop of great uncertainty, you all are developing and executing strategies that will put billions of dollars on the table. Next slide, please, PJ. We will focus our webcast today on only three areas, just a smattering of what is in our full energy industry update, and we'll provide you with a link so that you can get the full update if you would like it at no cost. Uh, first up is Kristen Lyons. Uh, she is partner and transmission distribution and smart grid practice leader. Um, back a slide, please, PJ, on page one. Uh, and she'll talk about energy infrastructure. Next will be Todd Williams. Uh, Todd is partner and fossil generation practice leader, and he'll talk, of course, about fossil generation. And finally, uh, Ed Baker, partner and natural gas practice leader, will talk about natural gas. Helping us behind the scenes with questions and answers is Greg Leitro, partner and energy clean tech and sustainability research leader and the principal author of the Scott Madden Energy Industry Update. Next slide, please, CJ. Kristen? Thank you, Stu. Next slide, please. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going, going to cover three topics today. Overall demand trends and their implications. Transmission, why I remain bullish and, frankly, why we should be cautious. And electric and gas convergence, which I see as one of the major con contingencies impacting the grid today. As Stu mentioned, it's impossible to do a survey of everything happening in the industry or even everything happening in transmission, distribution, and smart grid so we picked a few areas we thought would be of interest. Next slide, please. We continue to see slow demand growth. After the Great Recession, the industry considered this perhaps a cyclical phenomenon. We now see that it is a longer-term trend driven by mandates and increased efficiency by way of new technologies, building codes, and replacement of long-term, less efficient energy stock in houses and appliances. EIA EIA publishes an interesting electricity demand growth chart that shows a downward slope of year-over-year -year growth. Overall, U.S. electricity consumption is growing at a sub-1% annual rate. This has huge implications for utilities. Fitch Ratings, quoted on this page, considers this a significant threat to utility credit profiles. And more and more, utilities are considering alternative structures, such as partial decoupling, as the volume-based model currently in effect may become less financially attractive over time. The chart on the upper left illustrates the growing number of jurisdictions allowing or considering loss revenue adjustment or decoupling mechanisms. Amid modest sales growth, the low interest rate environment continues to drive down allowed returns, even as commissions are requiring more frequent rate cases. Transmission returns have held up, but as the chart on the top right shows, overall ROEs are now pushing down toward 10%. Of course, while some utilities are considering alternative structures like decoupling, those risk lowering ROEs as well. 
system hardening, infrastructure upgrades, including cybersecurity initiatives, and growing pensions and benefits costs are going to be the next areas of discussion between utilities and regulators. So we expect that the friction between the factors of the needed investment to shore up electric infrastructure, particularly in T&D, ratepayer cost sensitivity, and adequate financial incentives for those investments to continue for the foreseeable future. Next page, please. As I mentioned, transmission was one of the key areas we wanted to focus on during this, this brief discussion. While we continue to be optimistic about the transmission build-out, we also see a number of trends restraining that build and, frankly, complicating it. Let me start with the reasons that we're optimistic. FERC recently reaffirmed and clarified its incentive rate policy, and transmission continues to provide solid returns, often over 12 percent ROE, which is very favorable compared with what I meant, just mentioned in the distribution environment. Coal retirements are driving the need for new projects, and aging infrastructure continues to drive new build, both upgrades and refurbishments. Renewables driven by economics and renewable portfolio standards are going to continue to require interconnection. And frankly, transmission remains one of the most versatile assets to hold. It enables access to markets for all types of generation and provides flexibility in the generation portfolio which, in my view, will be very important in the years to come. The issues that worry me include the following. First, load growth has slowed due to the recession and weak recovery, and it does not appear to be recovering for the reasons I just mentioned. In PJM, energy efficiency and demand response accounted for almost 15,000 megawatts of, quote, capacity in the most recent capacity auction. We also see distributed energy resources proliferating in certain regions. One could argue that's a complicating factor, but in reality, I believe it's going to reduce the need for long-haul transmission. Retail rate pressures continue, exacerbated, of course, by the weak economy. And with regard to transmission returns on equity, we're continuing to see challenges on ROEs granted to transmission projects and regions. I believe we're up to 10 complaints before FERC at this point. And lastly, why is it complicated? Um, First, Order 1000 was initially intended to provide clarity with regard to the role that non-incumbents could play. And as we're seeing from the compliance filings submitted to date, that clarity has not yet emerged. Um, we've seen the initial rulings by FERC on several Order 1000 compliance filings, um, and they've not yet accepted the Mobile Sierra argument um, with regard to the removal of the ROFR. I see this as potentially a protracted discussion between FERC and the various regions, and in some, it's not provided the clarity we'd hoped. With regard to the supply side alternatives, um, in our view, they, the mix of the supply side alternatives are complicating the grid. They appear in, on the grid in a much shorter time frame than traditional transmission lines, meaning that the grid that the planners plan for is changing more rapidly than ever before. Distributed energy resources, demand response, and energy efficiency projects, as well as gas-fired generation and renewables can all be installed much more quickly than transmission can be built. The transmission planners are living in a world of uncertainty that's frankly unprecedented. Next page, please. The next topic I wanted to spend some time on is one of the items that I consider to be a major complicating factor, both in transmission and generation, the convergence of the electric and gas industries. Due to low gas prices and the shift from coal, we're seeing a proliferation of gas fire generation. And not unlike what we've said over the years about electric transmission, the pipeline system is now being used in ways it wasn't envisioned when it was constructed. For this reason, we now have issues or potential issues in a number of areas. When we look at the contracting process, um, there's been a lot of discussion about attempting to align the gas and electric trading days. At present, electric generators can be forced to bid into the market prior to reserving the gas they need to meet their needs. This can lead to generators not having sufficient gas to meet the com commitments they make for the following day. The fact that gas plants are moving from peaking units down the generation stack due to prices primarily, means that the typical interruptible contracts many have used in the past may not be sufficient in the future. To the extent that plants are called upon for significantly more hours than contracted for, puts the availability of gas at risk. 
assuming that the contracts have not evolved with the usage of the facility. Importantly, NERC has stated, quote, it is economically infeasible for a peaking generator to make capacity reservation payments for firm service that it cannot recover from its sales of electricity. This is one of the challenges of bid-based markets in trying to address these issues. We also have risk associated with coinciding peak. Basically, that means cold winter days. That puts a strain on both LDCs meeting residential loads and gas fire generation meeting electricity requirements. These have led to price spikes and, in our view, could ultimately lead to reliability challenges. Importantly, the head of the New England ISO has called this issue their single most important strategic challenge. Pipelines are not built without firm contracts, and this is one of the fundamental differences between electric transmission and gas pipelines. Gas pipelines are, are built to meet firm contracts, and there is no contingency planning as it exists in transmission. So redundancy to meet the commitments that they've made is built in. In addition, the industry is facing a risk associated with common mode failure that it has not seen to date. To the extent that multiple gas plants are dependent upon a single gas pipeline, if that pipeline fails, several generating facilities may also go down. While transmission planning criteria require planning for the single or two worst contingencies on the system, including the loss of generation, they do not plan for these more extreme eventualities. And I would put loss of pipeline capacity to more than one generator as a, an extreme eventuality. Next, next page, please. As I mentioned, this tends to be a regional issue. And this slide and the next highlight the challenges on a regional basis. The color coding is intentional. Red means danger, while green means we think we're doing OK. We've attempted to identify forces that work toward a solution and those that complicate the problem on a regional basis. You'll note that New England is highlighted in red. The region has served as the canary in the coal mine on this issue and has been extremely proactive in attempting to work it. Gas fire generation currently makes up over 40% of its generation capacity, and I, I actually believe that number is over 50% now. It's also the region where the challenge is most acute. It has a bid-based market, making the recovery of capacity payments for firm contracts infeasible, and it has limited local resources and high gas peaks in the winter. It's also at the end of the pipeline, and pipeline capacity into the region has been demonstrated to be constrained. You'll note that MISO is portrayed as yellow, and this is mainly due to the retirement of coal units underway, and, there are, and the studies indicating the issues with pipeline capacity to that region as we see the migration to gas fire generation. The southeast fares better. While we're seeing a move to more gas fire generation, we don't have the issues inherent in a bid-based market. Moderate weather also works in the region's favor. Next slide, please. Moving into the west, we see the Pacific Northwest in reasonably good shape due to the abundance of hydro. There is also good gas supply from the Rockies and Canada, and they continue to work in a traditional market, i.e. non-bid based. Recent pipelines expan expansions in the region also help. Um, California is challenged, again, largely due to its high penetration of renewables requiring the use of gas-fired units to address intermittency as well as the nature of the bid-based market that I've mentioned a number of times. Additional factors that need to be considered in electric and gas coordination are the availability and type of gas storage available, proximity of nearby gas supplies, whether they be traditional or shale, and the history of cooperation on these issues. These will all complicate or facilitate resolution depending upon the region. Several regions have formed ad hoc working groups to attempt to find solutions, and several RTOs are leading efforts to study the issue and propose solutions. In fact, New England ISO has also filed one potential solution with FERC related to the alignment of the gas, trading, gas and electric trading days. Because the regional challenges are so different, it's our view that the solutions will ultimately need to be regional as well. FERC can provi provide backstop rulemaking to, to facilitate communication and emergencies and alignment of training days, but we believe the regions will be best served by regional solutions to these issues. And I'm going to turn it back to Stu. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Next slide, please, PJ. Todd Williams, partner and fossil generation practice leader, will talk about fossil generation. Todd? Thank you, Stu. Next slide, please, PJ. So I'd like to start with the headlines. In fossil generation, we currently see two key trends. The first is around anticipated coal plant retirements. 
spurned by EPA regulations, persistent low natural gas prices, uh, the retirements continue to increase. However, some owners are going to hold on, at least for a while, for various reasons, including successes with retrofit technology, uh, performance of other plants and their fleets, rate impacts, and system reliability. The second key trend that we're seeing is um, for coal plant owners contemplating retrofits, the supply chain is increasingly cause for concern in regions such as the Midwest. EPA deadlines and large volumes of plants uh, concurrently requiring retrofits are going to stress the, cap stress the uh, capability to complete the refurbishment in a timely manner. Given these headlines as a backdrop, I want to walk through the landscape of fossil generation from four points of view. The 2012 election and policy developments, uh, North American Reliability Corp, or NERC's latest view on reliability, coal plant retirement risks, and supply chain issues for retrofit and replacement. Next slide, please. So I wanted to talk about the 2012 presidential election and policy shifts. Uh, due to time constraints today, this presentation is not a comprehensive view of the new host of regulations faced by fossil generation owners. That would probably take all of our available time and then some. Um, if you're interested in what those regulations are and what they mean, I encourage you to visit Scott Madden's website uh, for more detailed information. We are, though, taking real-time questions, so if you want to ask more about this area, please do um, submit a question. So what I wanted to cover now are three areas, the current views and the implications for each. First is power plant emissions regulations. Uh, currently, the various rules in play are driven by statutory deadlines as well as revisions driven by court challenges. While you may be better off with a legal degree and a very detailed calendar to keep up, the punchline is that those in the no pundits are split on whether rulemaking will be more or less aggressive uh, post-presidential election. Um, the, the, the advocates on the, on the more um, aggressive side believe that that um, with with the win, uh, with the presidential election win, that that there's a there's a new mandate for uh, for for continuing to to push a green agenda. Um, on the on the other side of the coin is with the um, with several regulations successfully challenged or being you know challenged by um, uh, very very strongly challenged in courts and 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 some some losses on the judicial side that um, that the EPA will step back a little bit. Um, so, so, you know, the, 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 it's split currently. Um, also of note here is the transfer of the leadership of the EPA from Lisa Jackson to Gina McCarthy, who was dubbed by some as Obama's green quarterback. Uh, the implications here are that we believe these rules play out in the courts, not the legislature, and that the emissions markets are likely dead while the legal wrangling goes on. President Obama signed a uh, signal to focus on climate change in his State of the Union address. And additionally, new source greenhouse gas regulations for fossil fire power plants and refineries will be released. The implications here are that uh, split Congress likely limits comprehensive greenhouse gas regulations. And additionally, based on new climate focus, we believe that there is a potential of a carbon tax in any budgetary grand bargain. And third, there's a possibility of expansion of greenhouse gas controls via regulation of existing facilities. The final topic here is the extension through 2013 of the production tax credits. Uh, will we see a final dash to renewable construction in 2013? Uh, the wind industry has been very successful in um, getting PTC extensions um, in either when either party are controlling the House. Um, but we'll, we'll leave that to an open question based on the underlying politics. We do believe that there are potential grants of relief in some states to near-term renewable portfolio standards deadlines. Next slide, please. Let's talk about long-term reliability. In NERC's annual reliability assessment published late last year, the good news is that the bad news is not as bad as we thought it was last year. However, there's still some cautionary notes. First is that we will see significant fossil fire uh, generator retirements over the next five years. NERC estimates about 71 gigawatts retiring by 2022, with the vast majority of those retiring by 2017. Estimates are still wide-ranging, but NERC says that there's about 44 gigawatts confirmed. Um, of those currently announced for retirement, the average plant age at retirement is, is 53 years, and the average cap capacity factor is about 34 uh, percent. These capacity factors mean that these plants slated for retirements are not running at base load, 
Um, and the levels suggest instead they're dispatched for grid reliability. Uh, the near-term re retirements may create some system stability issues, which leads us to our next finding. Most controls are required by 2016 to meet MATS, which is the mercury and air toxic standards compliance. NERC estimates that about 339 unit level retrofits, representing about 160 gigawatts, will be required. The total picture of maintenance and outage schedules is still unknown. This may result in a generation capacity in the near-term 2013 to 2016 timeframe. We'll talk about the capacity impacts a little bit later. Um, finally, while it's not new news, NERC discusses the increased dependence on natural gas for electric generation, which my colleague Kristen covered in her section. The key point here is that the generation side um, is with almost 100 gigawatts of planned and con conceptual new capacity in gas fire generation, we're entering a period where we are essentially putting all of our eggs in one basket. While individual corporate analytics leads everyone to the same answer, on the aggregate, the same answer rings some alarm bells that harken back to the early 2000 boom-bust period of gas generation development. Two other issues uh, worth mentioning that did not make the chart. The flip side of slower demand growth is that it takes the pressure off the supply picture. Moreover, demand side programs are expected to grow and continue to avoid some incremental capacity needs. And then finally, transmission, transmission growth is expected to be significant over the next five years, which should help with some reliability issues. Next slide, please. When we look at regional reliability issues, those that have been paying attention will know that there's trouble in Texas. Uh, reserve margins are below the reference margin level in every year and is zero by 2020 unless more capacity is at, as added. Um, these capacity deficiencies could mean increased reliance on DSM, a potential rolling blackouts. As shown on the bottom graph across the rest of the United States, we find expanding concerns but less urgent than Texas. Longer term, reserve margins begin to fall below reference levels in some other regions, uh, but these regions have at least five to ten years to enhance capacity. Next slide, please. NERC has its projections for total retirements, but so do many other experts. If you remember from a couple slides back, NERC estimated 71 gigawatts by 2022, with the majority of it in the next four years. While other expert projections are all over the map, we see a sweet spot estimate of about 30 to 100 gigawatts between 2015 and 2020. As most of our audience knows, there's two driving forces for these retirements. The first is the regulatory tsunami on coal. We used to call this a train wreck, but we've upgraded it to a tsunami. Um, with the re-election of President Obama, uh, first-term EPA regulations affecting power generation are now expected to be promulgated and implemented. Uh, the second is the current and projected price of gas, as my colleague Ed will discuss in a few minutes. And not to steal his thunder, um, but it's currently very low and projected to stay low, meaning, uh, making coal less competitive from a price perspective. And just like natural selection, these two drivers are calling the herd of coal plants of weaker, um, less effective units that may otherwise would have hung on for system reliability reasons. Of the two drivers, though, let's be very clear that the first, the EPA regulations, is the primary driver for retirement. Without the impending regulations, many utilities may otherwise choose to weather the gas price issue and, and hold on. One interesting subtrend that we're seeing is what we call unretirements. Some generators are uh, rethinking the retirement of the units they've already announced, and uh, you can see a list of those at the bottom of this slide. Next slide, please. So let's look at the number of coal generators in the United States. There's almost 1,000 coal units with a total nameplate capacity of 327 gigawatts, representing about 44% of total generation in 2011. 611 units, of those, 611 units of the total do not have the requisite pollution controls, including flue gas desulfurization or scrubbers installed, and can be considered at risk for compliance with the Utility MACT rule. As the pie chart indicates, the hardest hit regions are RFC and CERC. Um, RFC covers New Jersey, uh, Pennsylvania, Maryland, out to Michigan and Indiana and parts of Illinois. Um, CERC is a very large region, it covers Kentucky, Tennessee, uh, Mississippi, all the way over to the Carolinas and, uh, and Virginia. Next slide, please. To wrap up my, se my section this afternoon, the final point of view to consider is the timing of replacement and retrofits and the impact of supply chain. With compliance deadlines approaching, there's a big bubble of new construction and retrofit projects coming through the pipeline. 
These are big, long physical engineering projects. This work is best scheduled in the shoulder months, leaving a narrow window of opportunity for the work to be conducted on a lot of units. Compounding the problem is the availability or lack thereof of skilled labor supply. We see this in rising costs and short supply. So Scott Madden's advice to utilities is to monitor contractor liquidity and performance closely, increase competition and aggressive bidding on projects, as it also increased the risk of liquidity and performance issue, issues with both general and subcontractors. And rising material costs exasperate, exasperate this risk. This concludes the fossil generation section. So let's go to the next slide. And Stu, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Todd. Ed Baker, partner and gas practice leader, will cover our third topic today, natural gas. Ed? Thank you, Stu. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, next slide, please. I imagine most of the folks on this call are familiar with the key trends right now in gas. Low prices with ample supply and mild winter demand, except for the last few weeks. And then the shale story. I'm going to touch on price, shale, the US role internationally, and pipeline capacity. Next slide, please. First, let's up level set on pricing. This week, uh, we topped $4 an MMBTU. Uh, this is the first time in a year and a half. Uh, two years ago, uh, natural gas was trading for 435, but last year at this time, two dollars and nine cents, and shortly thereafter dropped below two dollars last April after a warm winter. So, although there's not a significant change from two years ago, uh, 435 to four dollars, just over four dollars, you can see there's significant volatility. Uh, going down below $2 and now uh, doubling back up to 4 As far as demand, uh, gas demand in the residential, commercial, and industrial sectors largely has been flat or declining in recent years. However, natural gas consumption for power generation has continued to grow as natural gas has become the fuel of choice for power generation. Output from plants fired by natural gas jumped almost 24% in 2012. Now it is not only offsetting coal, but nuclear generation is down 2.5% during that same time. The Kiwani plant is one example of low natural gas prices actually contributing to its closure. Another boost in demand is coming from manufacturing. EIA predict, outlook predicts U.S. manufacturing output will increase by an average 2% per year over three decades, which is 20% more rapidly than analysts predicted, projected just one year ago. These, of course, are large users of natural gas. Numerous petrochemical companies have announced plans to build, reopen, or expand North American production because they now anticipate long-term access to low-priced natural gas, which they use as a feedstock. This is certainly a turnaround for the industry, which as recently as 2004 closed down 70 U.S. facilities as uneconomic due to high-priced natural gas. NGVs also have been growing to demand a small amount of natural gas supply. So there's a great deal of demand with a supply response, which we'll touch on in a moment, that may serve as a natural limiter of price increases. But all these demand and supply forces make it challenging to project future natural gas prices. I call your attention to the gray, red, yellow, green, and blue lines in the second chart. These are gas price predictions going back to 2005 as to what prices would be in 2012 and beyond. The range is from $4 to $7.50. Look at the second dot in each line, which represents 2012. The actual was $2.75. So every prediction was wrong, including the one made in January 2012 for $3.60. So why is that? Next slide, please. This We can talk a little bit about some of the why here. Remember those colorful lines on the prior page? Predictions of gas prices ranging from $4 to $7.50. The gray bar here is the break-even for shale. Most are between $4 and $7.50. So on the supply side, they're making drill, no drill decisions based on predictions, which are gyrating around break-even, and for 2012 at least, are all wrong. So when they were looking at these higher estimates, they were drilling when they shouldn't, and then what ends up happening too is then they don't drill when they should. So at the moment, we're working through the supply bulge caused by drilling when we shouldn't. Uh, we get price signals that indicate above break even, so we drill. But everyone does it, which is why 2012 prices at 275 are below break even for most producers. 
So we have the demand we talked about on the prior page, putting upward pressures on prices. And here on the supply side, the boatload of supply, responding to any increased prices, which puts downward pressure. So this is a this push-pull effect, both having lengthy decision and investment timing, creates a significant amount of price volatility. Next slide, please. The natural gas industry is rightfully bullish about the opportunity for shale gas production to continue to transform the energy landscape. And the decades of gas demand that these resources could serve is promising. But these bullish views need to be tempered with realities of the relative immaturity of experience in many plays, supply demand realities in the near term, possible regulatory restraints, and resource intensity. The first point, relative immaturity of the plays, is one consideration. Resource estimates are exactly that. They're estimates and are subject to refinement as producers gain more experience in the plays. Shale plays have rapid decline rates, so long-term productivity for them is still being assessed. Moreover, each play is different. And while technology advances have helped make more of the shale resource economic, potential resources are not the same as economically viable resources. Which leads to our second point, that with the high initial productivity, a gas glut and continuing low natural gas prices places some strains on producer cash flows. In a few cases in the past 18 months, some producers have slowed production in response. Liquids extraction has been helping in some play, has been helping some place remain profitable and cash positive, but not all of these have liquids as well as dry gas. Our view has been that prices would equilibrate higher in response. If it seems too good to be true, it probably is. And we see others adopting that position. Uh, this should help shale producers in the long term. Third, regulatory activity, especially environmental, remains a wild card, possibly restricting development of shale resources in places unaccustomed to it. EPA has stepped up involvement and expects to complete a study of hydraulic fracturing by 2014, which could be the precursor of rulemaking and increased regulation. States are adopting their own stances. Texas, with a long history of gas development and fracking, is supportive with oversight. Pennsylvania is as well, despite some local opposition. New York is yet to decide how to deal with this, imposing a moratorium on new development. And this was just extended uh, recently to May 2015. This will continue to evolve and may limit the potential of shale gas supply. Finally, setting aside environmental regulation, fracking is a water resource intensive activity. The chart at the right illustrates this point. For some drought prone areas, this is a concern as water availability globally remains a perceived point of vulnerability for all kinds of energy production. So producers, producers will need to develop ways to reduce and reuse water. In some cases, production may have to be scaled back during times of extreme water stress. All of these demonstrate that considerations of supply, demand, and externalities will interact in unpredictable ways, tempering excess of bullishness on shale gas. Next slide, please. There's a debate on whether the U.S. can become the Saudi Arabia of natural gas. This page looks at the two sides of LNG. You may remember that regarding LNG imports, there was a build it and they will come strategy. Uh, that didn't work out so well. Many trying to uh, import found out that this truly is a global market. Uh, there's certainly a need for natural gas worldwide. With $12 gas in Europe and $16 gas in Japan, the market looks attractive. In Japan, post-Fukushima, post they shut down 54 nuclear power plants, leading to a reliance on LNG to fill the capacity gap. Japan's demand for LNG jumped by 18% in their fiscal 2011, and is ex expected to grow another 8% in their fiscal 2012, which ends this month. The emerging importers, Argentina, Bra Brazil, uh, Chile, Kuwait, to name a few, uh, are still getting to full import capacity, and in Latin America, Southeast Asia, and the Middle East, floating regasification terminals allow them to shorten the time required to receive cargoes. However, as learned in the LNG import side, there's a lot of competition to supply these needs. Qatar has achieved its target of liquefaction capacity. Growth is expected in Australia. And Eastern Africa and Eastern Mediterranean are pegged to become exporters. So there's varied opinions on whether LNG export is economically viable or prudent even for energy security for domestic gas consumers. 
Exports of natural gas, including LNG, must be authorized by DOE's Office of Fossil Energy. By statutes, by statute, exports of LNG to free trade agreement nations must be approved without modification or delay. By, con by contrast, before approving an application to export LNG to non-free trade agreement nations, DOE must determine that the export is and will remain in the public interest. DOE's primary focus is upon the domestic need for the gas to be exported. In May 2011, DOE conditionally authorized Sabine Pass to export LNG to non-free trade agreement nations, the first and only authorization. However, there are currently 15 additional pending applications to export LNG to non-free trade agreement countries. Multiple applications are also pending at FERC to authorize the construction and operation of liquefaction facilities at LNG terminals needed to export domestic LNG. More export and construction requests are anticipated. These then need DOE approval. In addition, related infrastructure projects, such as the construction or modification of pipelines to deliver domestic supplies to LNG export terminals, are also con under consideration. So there will likely be some modest LNG, and U.S. natural gas prices certainly may increase when, uh, when the U.S. exports LNG. But the global market limits how high U.S. natural gas prices can rise under pressure of LNG exports because importers will not purchase U.S. exports if the U.S. wellhead price rises above the cost of competing supplies. Next slide, please. As Kristen teed up, uh, gas infrastructure was built to do one thing, but we we're asking it to do another. It was originally intended to move gas from the Gulf Basin to market areas, so cities where people live. Now gas supply is in places where we used to not get it, so there are backflow requirements. Gas was set up to serve established cities. Now on a daily equivalence basis, a 500 megawatt combined cycle looks like the city of San Antonio just popped up. Gas distribution pressures vary from uh, quarter pound per square inch to 200 PSI, but new turbines need constant pressure at a much higher uh, PSI. And gas system was set up to serve seasonal load variations. Hourly flexibility is very limited. Electric has intra-week and intra-day variability big time. So one of the things, one of the primary things is you must be able to move it somewhere. New infrastructure is going to be required to move natural gas from the regions where production is expected to grow into areas where demand is expected to increase. Not all areas are going to require new pipeline infrastructure, but many areas, even those that have a large amount of existing pipeline capacity, may require significant investment to connect new supplies to market. In addition to the new pipeline mainline transmission capacity, pipeline laterals are going to be required to connect new power plants, new gas storage fields, and new gas processing facilities to the network of natural gas transmission pipelines a new gathering system capacity will be required to connect new producing wells to processing facilities and pipelines. However, ironically, dry gas prices must move to a higher level to encourage construction of this infrastructure. So the bottom line on, all, on the infrastructure piece is when we build a lot of gas, we're asking the gas system to perform work that is outside its design basis. The question of who pays is the challenge. Now I'd like to turn it back to Stu. Thank you, Ed. Next slide, please, PJ. Also, just want to thank Greg Leitra, who's been helping us behind the scenes with uh, questions, and want to thank um, those of you who have submitted questions. We've gotten some really, some really good ones. Next slide, please. So, first question, Todd Williams, is for you. Um, thinking about EPA, what are the other areas that you think EPA is likely to start regulating? Will they go after the gas plants next? Thank you, Stu. Um, I, I, I guess I asked for the question, but um, it, it, let's look at the current kind of big three rules first um, to, to, to level set here. The, the first rule is the cooling water intake um, under the Clean Water Act 316 Bravo. The final rule for that is delayed until June 2013. Um, the implications on that is, is that is that power power plants may have to um, build cooling towers. So I won't, I won't go too deep into that. Um, the second 
rule is the mercury and air toxic standards, or MAT. Um, the final standards are released in 2011 for new plants, revised rule pending. Um, the third rule is the cross-state air pollution rule, uh, which was vacated last year. Those, those are, we traditionally call those the big three. I guess they're the big two now. The, there are two others on the horizon to get to the question. The, the first is um, coal combustion residuals, uh, or CCRs. And the question there is whether to treat coal ash as a um, solid or a hazardous waste. It was proposed in 2010, and there's two, there's two alternatives um, really on the table. Um, either one of those are, are, um, are potential, that the hazardous or the, um, or the solid waste. Um, the, if it's a hazardous waste, it becomes kind of a comprehensive waste program and it's federally enforceable. Um, if it's a solid waste, then EPA performance standards for coal ash handling facilities, state enforcement, wet handling of coal ash through impoundment with liners. We'll see any one of those factors or, or maybe multiple ones. Um, the second rule is greenhouse gas new source performance standards um, for electric generation. It was proposed in March of 2012. EPA is not expected to act on it until, um, until probably sometime this year. Um, proposed cap of about 1,000 pounds of CO2 per, per megawatt hour. Um, it's pegged to natural gas combined cycle. Uh, the EPA estimates about 95% of natural gas combined cycle constructed between 2006 and 2010 meet the standard. Um, it, it allows construction of new generation with a commitment to later install um, carbon capture sequestration equipment. Uh, but, but no one believes that's practical now. Um, and it grandfathers traditional units, new generation with pre-construction permits and, and ones that begin construction by late this month. Um, the theory is, uh, so, so those are the two rules. Um, what, we, what we think, our theory is, is that there's a trade of the Keystone um, pipeline for carbon legislation, which Republicans might go for because it would otherwise um, carbon gets regulated under the Clean Air Act, which would not be good. It, it would be a mess. Um, and also, there's a certainty of there's certainty of a possibility of fracking regulations. After the water study of 2014, um, they may revisit the exemptions to the main authorities uh, that gas and oil drilling have. While most think that this takes Congress to get it done, um, if the Democrats take the House in 2014, this could be possible. So, Stu, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Todd. Question for Kristen. Kristen, you were talking about the timelines for supply alternatives in comparison to transmission, that they were shorter than transmission. Of course, I think anything shorter than the timeline for transmission. What, what, what exactly did you have in mind? What do you mean, and why does this matter, the difference in timelines between supply side alternatives and transmission? Uh, thanks, Stu. Um, sure. It's, what I was talking about, referring to, was that when transmission planners are considering the upgrades that are needed to the grid, they're usually looking five to ten years out, and they consider new generation, load growth, et cetera, within that time frame. Um, now we're seeing resources that can significantly impact loads, like I mentioned, the demand side management and energy efficiency in PJM, um, and other sources like renewables um, that can appear on the grid in much shorter time frames. So this complicates the transmission planning world. Um, and we saw some of these issues surface when renewables began to interconnect. Um, you know, I don't know if anyone remembers some of the interconnection cues at the RTOs, but they were hundreds of years of work to address these much shorter intervals. Um, now we're seeing the same issue, but with myriad resources. The ability, the ability to re reduce demand in PJM, for instance, by 15,000 megawatts was a contributing factor to the cancellation of the PATH and MAP project last year. And then from the perspective of electric and gas convergence, we're seeing kind of a different flavor of the same problem. Um, gas generations and pipelines usually take from three to five years to put in the ground, and transmission is likely to take 10 years, give or take. To your point, it's a fairly long lead time asset from planning through construction. So I have a strong concern that particularly in markets where price signals drive location of new resources, 
that we may see gas infrastructure built out when a good transmission solution that actually could have been cheaper may be the better answer. Um, and we're actually hearing some of this discussion amongst the FERC commissioners right now in um, some of their recent comments to the press. Back to you. Thank you, Kristen. Ed, um, question for you. Uh, Asia is often discussed as a strong market for LNG exports, especially Japan, of course. You know, they're a little short after Fukushima and uh, talking about a lot of gas there. Do you think China's shale deposits will impact international supply? How, how will that affect the mix? Uh, well, China's reserves are expected to exceed the U.S. and Canada's combined, but no, there's really no meaningful exploration um, that's begun in the Tarim Basin due to its rough terrain and lack of water. And while the China National Petroleum Corp uh, has done some exploration work in the Sichuan uh, Basin. It's been reluctant to prioritize shale gas due to its high cost and lack of technology. So the general consensus is that uh, the Chinese companies are still years away from any meaningful production. They've got complicated uh, geologies, scarce water resources, uh, lack of foreign participation, and lack of experience in technology. These are all, of course, big barriers to mass commercialization of shale gas. Um, only three Western oil majors are engaged in exploration for shale gas with Chinese partners. The, uh, the Chinese state firms are trying to catch up by investing billions of dollars in U.S. shale gas projects. Um, their shale resources have high uh, kerogen and clay content, which makes them less brittle, which makes fracturing of these uh, really tough. It's been called taking a fresh box of Play-Doh and trying to frack it. Um, then there's also uh, significant water shortages. Um, the country only has about 2,100 cubic meters of renewable water resource, resources per person. Uh, U.S. has about 17,000 cubic meters per person by comparison. And uh, the, the water requirements there are, are greater. Um, in part because of that, the, the shale geology. Uh, so um, it, it, although there, there's su plenty of supply in the ground, uh, getting to it, um, it it's, it's just going to take years. So it won't be on the scene for, for a while. Thank you, Ed. Ed, here's another question for you. you. You talked about some of the obstacles in China to shale gas development. You know, folks always brag about the U.S. that we've got um, lots of shale, that we've got a technology advantage, and we've got clear property rights. And, and that's why it's taken off here much faster than anywhere else, uh, along with a favorable environmental regulatory regime. Are there regulations that threaten shale gas development? Um, and how do you think the objections to shale gas development will be resolved? We, we've all seen the movies, gas land, and everything else. What will happen in regulatory land with respect to shale gas development, in your opinion? Sure. The, the, the primary area is fracking regulation. Um, it's really a moving target and very unclear. Uh, in increasing the complexity of that is the, the fact there are more rigs and places unaccustomed to drilling which is making it more likely it's on the public policy radar that in those places, and more likely there will be events that heighten regulatory scrutiny. Uh, two big issues for the EPA are water and air. For water, it's acquisition and availability, uh, the, the chemical mixing, the well injection, flowback and produce water and wastewater treatment and disposal. The, uh, for air, the EPA has agreed to more closely study air emissions from fracking after the their auditor concluded uh, its current data is insufficient to make policy decisions. Um, now at the state level, there's a proliferation of regulatory interests in many states. Um, the, 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 the drilling grows and the profile in each state grows. Public policy interest heightens. The rules get codified. So state actions are roughly following the path of development. Um, how all this gets resolved, um, it, it's really through time. Um, you know, unfortunately, as, as I mentioned before, this is really right now just a moving target, and the picture's not not yet clear. 
Thanks, Ed. Todd, a uh, question for you. Uh, you talked about the big three and then the other two. Um, will these um, anti-coal environmental regulations, are, are they reversible, or is what you see what you get that this is permanent? So, so I, I, I take from the question, uh, you can usually figure out who, who or at least what constituent asked it. Uh, I think while generally I'm popular with utilities, uh, with coal portfolios who are concerned with the um, assumptions used about the ability to comply, um, the, the regulations and the regulatory process, um, followed regulatory process, sorry. Um, while it's true that a new administration can influence the regulatory enforcement, it's unlikely that they're reversible by the executive or legislative branches. I think that the real battle, battleground for these rulings are, is the judicial branch, and I, I think it's going to be um, years before as it plays out. Back to you, Stu. Thank you, Thank you Todd. Um, Kristen, um, here's a, an interesting question for you. Um, it's about the future of wires and T&D companies. The questioner said, given so many disruptive parameters, you know, uh, DR, renewable generation, energy efficiency, distributed generation, um, because of all these disruptive factors, are these companies going to become extinct? Or will the good players just exit and try and leave the wires business to the government? What, what do you think will happen with business models for wires companies, given so many disruptive parameters? Um, thanks, Stu. Um, I, my view is that we're going to see an emergence of uh, different business models over time. Um, what we're starting to see is that on a regional basis, companies are more or less willing to integrate innovative technologies, demand response, energy efficiency, um, and renewables, particularly distributed energy resources. That's, we're seeing a divergence across regions. So there are some regions, you know, if you think about California, some of the higher priced markets, where we're starting to see experimentation and integration of these various technologies, whether it be through pilot programs, um, incentive rate making, initiatives under the PUCs. Um, in other regions, we're seeing a lot less adoption of some of those more innovative technologies and resources. So my view would be that the utility models are going to evolve accordingly. Um, in some of the regions that have lower cost energy, um, and I think about the southeast and maybe the midwest, we're seeing smart grid applications evolve to a certain degree focused on demand um, distributed, dis distributed, I'm sorry, um, distribution automation. and. Um, some of the AMI applications, but they haven't gone toward the really innovative technologies like microgrids that we're starting to see emerge in the higher cost regions. So that's a long way of saying that I think that the utility models that emerge based on these regional factors are going to be very different, but I don't think we're going to see an exit of some of the best players um, to leave it up to the government. Thanks. Thank you, Kristen. Todd, um, here's a question for you about the emissions regulatory uncertainty. And, and the questioner asks, uh, given this uncertainty, will developers be cautious on CapEx uh, in, for generation despite the demand increase? And I guess we ought to talk about not just developers, but generation owners. Um, are, uh, is this going to scare them off on CapEx? So I, I would assume CapEx means new unit development. Um, I, I guess I would question the premise. Um, as the pace of load growth is decreasing, going back to Kristen's main presentation, um, the revenue stream is uncertain. About 50% of new generation is expected to be gas-fired. So it, environmental regulatory risk is probably less than the question assumes um, in those areas, especially as the EPA has tied its greenhouse gas rules to performance of new gas plants. Um, I think I think developing development that happens inside a rate base, um, the, the environmental costs and additional environmental costs are recoverable, um, and so 
and so I, I don't think it, it's going to impact in that. I think, I think there is going to be continue to be caution um, for developers who are developing on spec. Um, there is a lot of uncertainty um, if you're if you're not going with <coughs> excuse me Caspar generation, um, and, and you're outside of, of you know if you're if you're moving towards coal, um, and and I think it breaks down <coughs> excuse me breaks down. Oh, Stu, I'm gonna <coughs> flip it back to you. I got something my. I wonder if Todd's a developer worried about this uncertainty and trying to write some checks. Um, one one last question, um, which I'll field, which is, will new power plants drive demand and hence drive up the price for natural gas, which would nullify the, the economic logic of shifting to natural gas? You know, Tom Farrell spoke about this a couple of days ago and cautioned about putting all of their eggs in one basket. Um, we have uh, been a little bit contrarian and seen price volatility for a few years uh, that others um, weren't calling for, and that's panned out. And we just think that as an industry, we need to approach natural gas price forecasting with a bit of humility. Back to Ed's slides, all of the forecasts have been wrong. Everyone is so certain that prices are going to be low. It's certainly possible that whether it's um, through LNG or new gas plants, or other demand sources or miscalculations on the supply side that reaching price equilibrium at a low rate may not be as easy as folks think. And um, we just think that there are larger uncertainty bands around the price forecast than most do. Well, that um, uh, leads to the end of our uh, time slot. So let's go ahead and wrap up. And on behalf of Scott Madden, I'd like to thank each one of you for joining us today. Uh, please feel free to contact any of us if you'd like to talk over these or other topics. We really would love to hear from you. For everyone who joined us today, we'll send you a link to the full edition of the Scott Madden Energy Industry Update, which has a lot more content. And if you like, you can subscribe at no cost. So once again, thank you. And now I want to turn the floor back over to PJ at Energy Central, who will close us out. PJ? Thank you, Stu, and again to the speakers for a fantastic presentation. We hope uh, for our audience that you have enjoyed today's presentation. As you log off, please take a moment to complete our survey and to give us your feedback so that we can continue to provide you with quality content. Thank you for attending, and this does conclude today's presentation.